Um, can I start by uh, congratulating the Lithuanian Presidency on the conference? I think uh, what has struck me over the course of the last uh, day and a half uh, is the excellent balance that's been struck between some challenging and thought-provoking presentations, but lots of opportunity for everyone in this room to participate and shape thinking as the conference has uh, developed. So I would like to say on behalf of everyone here, uh, thank you very much to the uh, presidency for that. Um, the job of rapporteur is an interesting one. Um, you've got to try and strike the balance between simply saying again what you've already heard, um, but at the same time remaining reasonably faithful to the nature of the uh, discussion that's taken place over the course of the last day and a half. So what I want to try and do is to partly give you some reflections which will be personal reflections, but partly also try to pull out some of what I think have been the key themes uh, about leadership which um, have a, a, a developed. And you'll have seen both me and my second pair of eyes and ears, Rigodas, who's somewhere. Rigodas, where are you? Yeah. Yeah. So I want to say thank you to him because uh, we've been drifting in and out of, of, of groups and trying to, to capture the flavour of, of uh, what's been said over the course of the last um, uh, day and a half. Um, one of the continuing themes or recurrent themes that we've been uh, uh, posing as we propose is is the nature of uh, the challenges that are facing education in the 21st uh, century. Um, and the quote that's on the, the, the screen um, from the Prime Minister of Singapore kind of sums up uh, some of the, the, the nature of the challenge that faces 21st uh, century education. And picking up on some of the things that uh, Dr. Bond said earlier on, um, OECD, which you've probably seen, published a, a very interesting uh, a uh, uh, small booklet uh, earlier this year looking at the trends that are shaping uh, education in the 21st century and uh, they cover the areas that uh, you can see, just about see on the screen, it's pretty faint, but just about see on the, on the screen and, and some of that was picked up in the, in the earlier uh, presentation. I want to look in particular just very quickly at the theme of technology which has run through um, both the presentations but also the discussions in the, in the groups. Um, and just the, the implications of changes and developments in technology and connectivity more generally uh, for uh, education because I suspect that uh, across uh, Europe most of us are really just at the foothills at the very earliest stages uh, of understanding the way in which uh, developments in technology are going to affect uh, the nature of schooling and the nature of, of, of learning and, and teaching. Um, and the first point on the screen, I think, is a very important one. Um, we probably mainly are still at the stage of where, by and large, we're using technology to help us do what we've always done a bit better. So it tends to be uh, a more efficient way of uh, uh, engaging in the teaching and learning process. But we're just beginning to see the glimpses of the way in which technology is changing the paradigm, that the nature of teaching and learning itself, the way in which uh, our young people engage uh, uh, with learning um, is already beginning to, to change and those points have arisen on a number of occasions uh, both in the discussions and in the, in the presentations and, and the issue of, of uh, uh, access to technology uh, and the way in which technology takes away the illusion of control uh, which teachers have had, that teachers are controlling uh, the learning process because as uh, our young people become more and more adept at being able to use technology to bypass uh, the classroom, bypass the school, engage in all sorts of different ways um, with learning, then of course our teachers are going to have to adjust and learn different ways of relating to that uh, learning uh, process. And schools are always behind the curve, uh, largely to do with investment. It's very difficult for schools to keep pace with the way in which our young people themselves are developing the technology. So we get issues of digital divides, we've got big issues in terms of digital safety. Um, the way in which any time, anywhere, learning will impact on, 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 the, on the classroom, and particularly uh, the handheld generation, the way in which uh, in some uh, jurisdictions and some schools um, uh, there's an attempt to resist the uh, advent of, of uh, handheld technology. Uh, coming into the school seen as a threat or as a, 
a diversion from the main business of learning, but actually uh, the future is how do we harness handheld technology and, and social networking in order to uh, better improve the, the learning of our, of our young people. And of course, uh, as Beatrix Bond said earlier, um, uh, what we have got is a, is a, a data deluge. We've got a huge amount of data that we can do collect, and the trick is to try and make intelligent uh, use of that data. Given all of that, um, over the course of the last 20 or 30 years, um, uh, a number of different approaches have been adopted to try and see how to affect what actually happens in classrooms. Taking those trends, and they're not new trends, they've been shaping education uh, over a number of, of, of years, um, there have been attempts to say, well, how do we go about affecting what happens in the day and daily business of teachers and young people? classrooms and we know the research tells us that by and large the classroom has remained relatively impervious, well insulated from a lot of what happens in the broader policy environment and we've had um, approaches which are about packaging uh, new approaches to teaching and then trying to push them uh, into the classroom, sometimes called spray and pray, uh, that you uh, hope that something is picked up and it's put out and we the, the, the 60s and 70s in particular were very strong in that. Uh, the whole school effectiveness management measurement movement was all again an attempt to change the nature of what happens on a day-to-day -day basis inside a classroom between a teacher and a pupil. Similarly, the whole business of competition, which um, Razi Silver talked about uh, yesterday, uh, uh, creating a context within which con competition uh, is intended to uh, drive uh, quality improvement in the classroom. Uh, what we haven't done too much of uh, is to uh, address the hearts and minds approach, um, trying to engage schools, school leaders, teachers much more directly in the process of uh, educational change and taking greater ownership uh, of that process. Underlying all of that has been a, a view uh, or, or contrasting views of teachers and schools which uh, I've polarised uh, on the screen. Uh, uh, at one end, there's a very optimistic view uh, of teachers and schools, that essentially teachers are trusted and self-motivated professionals whose potential needs to be realised and that schools are good environments for learning, needing greater freedom and better leadership. Uh, but at the other end of the spectrum, quite a lot of the, the change processes that we're engaged in actually have assumptions which are about a teaching profession which is basically incompetent but self-serving and needs to be driven, um, and schools which are essentially conservative organisations uh, which are slow to respond to external pressure. And that leads to the policy dilemma, and Pazzi Selmer um, uh, identified this, I think, very well uh, yesterday, in terms of uh, what's, how do we go about the process of change um, and what are the assumptions that we build into that? And that one, one approach, uh, which uh, is strongly represented, I think, in the Finnish context, and as he talks about it, is essentially what we need to do is to place much greater trust in the teaching profession and our teachers themselves. And that brings with it risks, and the, 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 the risks are uh, on the screen. At the other end of the spectrum, there's the much more directive, interventionist approach, high stakes, um, external pressure to try and bring about um, change in our school. So um, across all of our countries and across the world, we can see uh, different mixes uh, of that policy, sometimes very closely uh, intertwined. And the question is, what does that mean for our leaders, our school leaders and for leadership more generally? Given all of that context, given the, the trends, the pressures, uh, the external pressure that's coming from, from governments in terms of policy, what are the implications of all of that for um, leadership? first point that's come through across all of our discussions over the course of the day and a half is that leadership matters. Um, that uh, comes from the evidence of the OECD work and it comes from a whole range of different pieces of uh, research. Um, it can push you into the super principle um, uh, kind of, of, of uh, assumptions uh, that we need somebody at the heart of all of this uh, who has the capacity uh, to do all of the things that Beatrix uh, talked about in her um, presentation. And there is um, a gearing effect um, by focusing uh, more of our attention on leadership because, again, as, as Beatrix said in her um, uh, presentation, um, working with, with, with the leadership, uh, working the area of leadership, 
has a multiplier effect, and therefore the gearing in terms of trying to bring about change can work in your uh, favour. Um, leadership, of course, is a, is, a, is a huge industry, not just in education. It's, uh, you just need to wander through any bookshop in any um, railway station or airport, and the shelves are filled with uh, advice about uh, how to be a good leader, 10 steps to being a good leader. I, I thought uh, leadership actually means. And actually, once you look at a lot of that, it is banal. It doesn't actually uh, take you much further. It just skates across the surface and, and by and large, rehearses um, uh, things that are either uh, self-evidently good, but how do you do it, question is left, uh, or uh, somebody's pet theory, which there is a piece of snake oil, which they're trying to sell uh, and make money out of. Um, and I sometimes wonder if we, um, it's a little bit uh, evident in the discussions that we've had over the last uh, day and a half, whether the concept of leadership itself is getting a bit stretched. Um, uh, we do bring to it um, uh, uh, assumptions which, are, which come from other aspects of, of society, of life, or journey, which tend to be the heroic leader, tend to be uh, focusing on the, on the individual and the way in which that individual can bring about uh, uh, change. But in fact, the process of change and how you create a culture within which um, change is organic inside a school rather than driven by uh, individuals inside uh, schools is much more complex uh, than um, uh, the simple concept of leadership uh, um, can mean a part of a simple concept. And of course, in our different countries uh, across Europe, uh, the idea of leadership is different. Stay the same word. Uh, is used, but actually what lies behind it in terms of our understanding of what that means is uh, significantly uh, tied up with our history and our culture and the way in which we think about uh, society uh, more generally. So there's lots of theories. Uh, there are theories which are to do with the individual traits that leaders are born, not created. Uh, there are things to do with adopting a style, an approach to leadership. There are things which are, says that leadership is very, very context specific. That what works in one context won't work in another context, and you have to understand the context. And more recently, a lot of the emphasis has been on distributed leadership. And again, we've talked about that over the course of the last uh, day and a half, and I want to come back to that in, in, uh, in a second. Um, so the area that we're dealing with, which I think is, is very well chosen um, uh, by the presidency, is a very complex one, and one which, if we get it right, can make a huge difference which is very difficult to get right. It's very difficult to actually translate the high conceptual understanding into the reality of this child and this teacher in this classroom doing things differently that respond to the needs of that child and the broader requirements of uh, society. Um, a couple of quotes uh, on the screen which are relatively um, uh, straightforward, but they remind us, um, first of all, the, the, the Drucker quote reminds us, you cannot base your assumptions about leadership on the fact that we're going to have super leaders in every school, uh, in every uh, set of, of policy makers, in every minister. Uh, you just cannot make those assumptions. So when we're talking about leadership and thinking about leadership, we've got to have an approach which recognizes human fallibility, recognizes that the, the, the nature of leadership, you cannot assume uh, that it's going to be that the, that the super principle super leader is the one that's going to be there. And the second one uh, is the Eisenhower one. It's interesting because it's about ownership. It's about the real trick of leadership is people doing what you want them to do but thinking they're doing it because they want to do it. Um, it's, it's managing to, to get that trick of uh, getting uh, the direction right that people feeling, well, actually, that we, that's what we thought in the first place. You know, that's what we wanted to do. And that's uh, um, an important aspect of leadership. A number of other quotes. Um, uh, on, the, on the screen, uh, which are more specific about a personal style of, of leadership. Um, can anyone guess who's, who's, who made those statements? Anyone any ideas who might have made those statements? Well, they're made by Pep Guardiola, um, the uh, coach of uh, Barcelona, now coach of, of Bayern Munich. And, uh, there's a lot to learn. Uh, from uh, the way in which, particularly, someone like Pep Guardiola has gone about the process of team building, uh, in, in, in initially in the context of Barcelona and subsequently in the, in the uh, now in, in Bayern Munich. But he picks up, interestingly, the quote picks up a number of things that we have uh, talked about. Um, it talks about bravery. 
you've got to live with the consequence, prepare to live with the consequences of the decision. It talks about energy, and uh, Michael Schratz opened the conference uh, talking about uh, energy and how you, saying energy is a better unit of currency than time. Uh, that teachers will give you lots um, uh, uh, if, 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 you, if you generate the energy without them counting the time. But if you don't get that right, you say, oh, we haven't got the time for this. And so that notion of, of, of energy is very important. And the whole business about creating the right conditions, again, has been a running theme uh, across all of the presentations over the course of the two days. I wonder if we have focused quite strongly enough on why schools are particularly difficult places to lead. Um, sometimes we're told that uh, education ought to learn from business. Uh, the, the important thing is, look at these captains of industry and these, the people who are leading in the private sector, and schools ought to be learning from that as to how to go about the process of uh, effective leadership. Uh, actually, I think that our principals uh, and our leaders in education, at their best, um, are at least as good as anything that happens in the private sector because they're managing in a much more, they're leading in a much more complex environment uh, than an environment where there's a bottom line, you know what you have to do in order to succeed, and you by and large have control over the levers that you can pull in order to try and, and uh, make that happen. But in a school, or even more widely in an education system, um, there's a, there are big legacy questions. There are big questions to do with the inheritance that you get uh, when you start in the, in, in the role, the norms and patterns of behaviour which are well established and rooted inside uh, our schools. And of course we're dealing with people. Um, people are the process and people are the product. Um, and the process is undertaken by people, many of whom um, feel that they ought to be uh, autonomous, that they ought to take the decisions and nobody else has the right to uh, interfere with what happens uh, inside uh, their classroom. And the performance, therefore, which in most other walks of life you can actually see and change, but the performance in a school is private. The performance is between a teacher and a group of young people, uh, which is not really uh, amenable uh, or easily amenable to the kind of, of external observation which um, can happen in all sorts of other industries. There's also a culture in schools of volunteerism. Um, if you don't want to do it, you don't do it. Uh, that somehow or other the nature of change is one which teachers opt into um, but don't necessarily have to do so. So there's, there is a, an assumption or a culture of volunteerism in many of our schools and of course what the end product is is highly contested. What, what, what do we mean by good education? What are the results that a school should be judged by? And uh, different stakeholders have very different views about the nature of the product. So it's highly contested. So as a leader, somebody who's responsible for trying to ensure that the school um, is successful, the leader has to be conscious of many different expectations uh, about outcomes which come from many different uh, sources. And in many jurisdictions, uh, actually has very few levers to pull. That they uh, often will inherit the staff that they get, very hard to change the staff that they have in front of them. Often the resources are very limited. They can't put the price up. Uh, and, and they're getting more resources. They're, they're limited in terms of what they can do. So they don't have the levers uh, that are often the case in other walks of, of life. And uh, uh, schools have a very powerful immune system. Um, uh, things that come from the outside, which they don't like, um, they can seek and kill. You know, they, they, they don't let them in. The immune system works to prevent um, ideas from the outside, which are not recognized as being the right kind of ideas actually don't uh, penetrate through. And Elmore talks about loose coupling, where in fact what we've tended to have in education is a, is a, uh, a context within which leadership, the management in the school, their job has been to protect the classroom from external pressures. So they, they manage that process and just let the teachers get on with it. They do all the other stuff. And basically the teachers get on with it. And there's a kind of conspiracy between the leaders and the teachers not to ask too many questions about what's happening inside the classroom. Just let them get on with it. And don't get too involved. But if we take the uh, McKinsey uh, quote uh, about the quality of an education system uh, cannot exceed the quality of its teachers, then it seems to be, and again it's been a recurrent theme across our uh, day and a half, that actually the key challenge for leadership uh, is to engage with teachers and to realise the full potential of the teachers that they have. Uh, and that means that um, leadership has to be seen in the context of the nature of the teaching force itself 
and in wider issues of governance and accountability. And again, Michael Schratz and, and, and day one talked about that relationship between agency and structure and the way in which we, we sometimes work in one or the other, but rarely uh, 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 apply them together. And Michael also referred to uh, John Hattie's work, and there's an interesting piece of research quoted in, in John Hattie about teachers' attitudes towards change. Um, the figures don't matter too much, but, it, but what it is suggesting that is that there's an overwhelming uh, view on the part of, of a teacher uh, that, that in order for them to change, um, there has to be huge evidence that what they currently do um, needs to be changed. They are very wedded to what they currently do and very resistant to things that come from the outside. The overwhelming majority of teachers, according to this research, would fall into that category with the usual smaller numbers that are early adopters and want to engage in the, in the process. And that means, again, something that we haven't discussed, and it's not for me at this stage of the process to, um, to open this up. But I do think um, in order for us to be clear about the nature of leadership in our school system, uh, we've got to be clear about the nature of the teachers that we're talking about. Um, the, the, the nature of, of those who are engaged in the learning and teaching process, what do they bring to uh, a school? Uh, and how does that interact uh, with the nature of leadership? I'm not going to go through the list of, of, of points on the screen. You could all come up with your own list, but it's, it's important to think that, that we do relate um, all of our discussions about leadership uh, to a clear understanding of, of what it means to be a teacher in our country and in a particular school. What are the characteristics of our teachers? And therefore, what can leadership uh, be expected to achieve uh, in that context? Because there can be a lot of naivety uh, naive assumptions about uh, the teaching profession, um, uh, which are unrealistic in terms of what can actually be achieved. So investing in, in the teachers, again, a big message uh, uh, more generally from uh, all sorts of different uh, uh, quarters is, is incredibly important. Um, Rick Stewart, who who's, uh, was, still is, I think, deputy head of the uh, inspector in the Netherlands, uh, introduced uh, at, a, at a conference that this notion of space which we've talked about on a number of occasions, this notion of professional space, this what teachers um, do when they're at work um, and this is what they do more widely and then it's how you create uh, the space uh, within which teachers can um, reflect and uh, plan and work in order to ensure that what they do on a day-to-day -day basis is uh, uh, as effective as it can be. And again, that, that word space has cropped up time and again across our uh, discussions over the course of the last two days. Another thought that uh, occurred to me, again in relation to the discussions, is the danger uh, in leadership, going back to what I said at the beginning, is that leadership can produce a kind of passive culture of followership. The notion is that somebody uh, will lead uh, and that I just have to wait uh, as a teacher in the school to decide whether or not I'm going to them or not. So that notion of the relationship between leadership and the culture in a school and getting leadership right so that it's not producing that passive culture of, uh, of followership is very important. And that's partly to do with who we select to be teachers in the first place, uh, how the kind of people that become teachers, are they the kind of people that are interested in education or want to be very narrowly engaged with the specifics of day-to-day, -day, are they a day-to-day -day work in a classroom, let alone apart from that. It means that uh, as a leader inside a school, capacity building of your staff is of critical importance to what you do. Um, that creating this distributed context of leadership, a culture of initiative, a culture within which uh, different people, no matter whether they are new teachers in the school or the very experienced teachers in the school, feel that they are part of the process of making that school better and are encouraged to be part of the process of making that uh, school better. Distributed leadership is sometimes thought of as um, distributed jobs, you know, unpaid work. So what you do is to get people to do things, to give them a role, uh, and uh, ask them to go on. And that's legitimate in its own right. But what I'm talking about there is something that's much more pervasive as a culture. It's not identifying a small number of people and giving them jobs to do. Uh, it's, a much, it's much more to do with the nature of the culture in South School. And again, across uh, our discussions, that notion of distributed leadership has come up, and, and uh, Beatrix Pond, in response to one of the questions, that she was asked uh, to refer to that. There's also consistency of understanding about uh, leadership and uh, professional standards in relation to leadership are developing in a number of countries. Those standards should relate to what we mean by 
um, uh, being a teacher. And they take us into this business of extending professionalism uh, and what it means to be a professional teacher of the 21st century, which is more uh, than, than, than uh, being a good classroom performer, or should be more than being a good classroom uh, performer. And leadership um, at its best, uh, this is back to the notion of energy, taps into that area of discretionary effort. Um, you know, any teacher in any classroom can do enough to get by. They can, be, they can do well inside their own classroom and they can do enough so that nobody can say you're not doing a good job. Um, but they can also give you that extra bit, which is at their discretion. They decide whether or not they want to give you or not want to give you. And one of the tests of leadership is the extent to which we tap into that discretionary effort to get people going above and beyond what's required uh, for the day-to-day -day job. And that's the notion of energy, leaders creating energy. Pep Guardiola talked about that. Leaders creating energy in uh, dynamism uh, inside a, a school. Um, we need, I think, and again it's run through the process, to see professional learning as being at the heart of innovation. Innovation has been a key theme that we've dealt with. Uh, but innovation that's not based on um, a rollout method, you know, where uh, back to the package and push the notion is there's an answer somewhere and you're just trained to do it, uh, but something that's much more uh, uh, organic and, and dynamic. And professional learning, if we get that right, uh, can be a key part of that, uh, uh, that process. And, and of course, we need to engage better in talent spotting and, uh, and mentoring. I wanted to finish just by picking up what I think have been uh, a number of the recurrent themes that have run through both the presentations uh, and the discussions in the groups that I hope and confidence will be reflected in your voting at the end in terms of the uh, uh, priorities which you, you see, recommendations that you want to, to make. Um, the notion of emerging future, which Mikhail Schratz talked about, is very important, and, but getting this balance right uh, in leadership terms between satisfying the here and now, because they have to satisfy the here and now, doing what is required in order to ensure the children that are in the school at this point in time are getting as high a quality education as possible, striking a balance between doing that well, but having an eye on the horizon, so you're gradually taking the school forward and understand uh, that balance between reproduction and transformation, which Mikael talked about. Uh, culture, again and again, the notion of culture has cropped up uh, in uh, both the presentations and in the discussion, creating the conditions uh, that uh, allow the kind of, of quality to, to be developed inside a school that's to do with agency and structure and, and, structure and energy, as I talked about earlier. Vision, uh, values, of critical importance um, those who are engaged in formal leadership roles, one of the most important things they can do is to help everyone understand, uh, uh, get a sense of direction, and to keep reinforcing the values, the things that should underpin uh, high quality education. And across uh, all of the uh, uh, presentation of two days, the notion of equity has come through uh, very powerfully, and that uh, uh, powerful message which comes from the OECD, there isn't a trade-off between equity and quality. Uh, the fact that the equity and quality are reinforcing and we need to get uh, our values in our schools have got to uh, champion um, uh, uh, both equity and quality. And as educators, we also need, I think, to distinguish between being well qualified and being well educated. Um, we need to be both, but sometimes we just stop at well qualified uh, and we see the purpose of schools as being to ensure that young people get the kinds of qualifications which they require. Now that's very important, but being well educated is more than that. Um, and again, uh, leadership inside the school has got to, I think, constantly strike this balance between the kind of things that are important for the here and now, particularly in terms of qualifications, and the broader messages about um, a well-educated young person in the 21st century, which is more uh, than just being uh, well qualified. I've spoken about space already, I'll not go into it. It's more physical space, it's space in terms of time. But it's also space in terms of permission. It's this notion of cultural permission. Um, it's space in, in to feel that you, sh you will, will uh, be allowed to do something without having to go and ask about it, that the permission is there in the culture. Um, sometimes in, in, the, in the UK we talk about uh, ask for forgiveness, not for permission. Have a go, uh, and then say afterwards, well, 
uh, as well in text, because we asked why I did what I would do. The whole notion of cultural fruition uh, inside the school is very important. Incredibly important, again running across all that we said, is this notion of career-long professional growth. That's career-long professional growth for our teachers, and career-long professional growth for those who are taking on formal uh, leadership roles. And the leader inside the school, those who are in formal leadership positions, should see themselves as lead learners. They should be modeling the kind of learning attitude towards learning and growth which they expect to see in their staff. Um, uh, we had one head teacher in Scotland who actually took off the, the, the name plate at his door, uh, no longer said head teacher, but said lead learner. Uh, and he was making a very strong personal statement about uh, who I am and what my job is and, and what I'm trying to model in, in, inside the, the school. Another theme that has been consistent in, in every discussion is about creating communities and networks. Um, isolation is the enemy of improvement. Isolation is the enemy of quality. Uh, we need to break into the notion, the traditional notion, of teaching is a very isolated profession, a very isolated job. Um, and the way in which uh, our, our teachers will grow and our schools will grow is acting much more as a community, much more learning from each other and with each other. Um, uh, that has been the tradition in terms of many of our schools, and that's both cross-sectoral, uh, it's transnational, we've talked about the way in which the uh, European Union, the Commission, can, can work on this uh, uh, process, and it engages all stakeholders. Again, uh, that's come through in the discussions uh, very strongly that, that I sat in on. And that builds on the concept of learning communities, collegiality, collaboration, breaking into this, this uh, isolation, uh, which all too often characterises um, 21st century, 20th century teaching. And that takes us back into this notion of distributed or shared leadership. And I won't dwell on that because I've spoken about it already. Uh, but I, I think as, as we're thinking about the, um, where, where this moves forward, one of the things we have to be careful about is that it doesn't send messages about leadership as being about individuals solely, about how you build the super principle. Um, that it is about how we uh, create the culture uh, within which there are many, many leaders inside a school. Some are formal positions, others take leadership roles for, uh, for different reasons. We get that notion of sharing. The notion of accountability has um, cropped up uh, on a number of occasions, and, and, and the very um, emotive phrase which uh, uh, the minister uh, quoted from Razi Selma, the toxic uh, accountability. The key word there is toxic. It's not accountability. The key word is toxic. Uh, accountability is an inescapable part of being a professional. Um, we, we cannot and should not wish to avoid accountability. We should be personally accountable and we should engage directly with the processes that help those that we are serving uh, to be able to hold us to account. That's a part of being um, a, a, a professional. The toxic bit is where we get that wrong, where it becomes oppressive, uh, where it's, it's, it's holding people to account for the wrong things but it's not reinforcing the kind of culture that we've been talking about over the course of the last two and a half days. So that notion of autonomy, responsibility, and getting the accountability um, uh, well understood, and getting that right, uh, again, is an important theme that we've dipped in and out of, uh, but which needs, to think, to be pursued. Um, and that takes us into the notion of trust and challenge. Um, it's not just simple trust. It's not just simply saying, I trust my teachers, they will get on, because that does raise issues about equity, it raises issues for individual children about variations in quality being acceptable, uh, and they aren't. Uh, uh, our collective responsibilities as educators is to ensure that every child gets the highest quality education possible. So simply trusting teachers doesn't work. So challenge, we've got to think about the way in which challenge is built into our, our schools and our education systems and our, our, us as individuals in ways that doesn't produce the kind of toxic effects which um, uh, Razi talks about. Uh, and that means um, having leadership which encourages reflection, encourages self-evaluation, um, encourages inquiry, active inquiry, uh, as part of the process of learning and, and, and growing. Um, Nikhil Franz talked about enticing and empowering. Interesting phrase. Also, I really like the beauty in the edge of catastrophe. I think that's, again, an interesting, uh, an interesting notion. There's a little bit on the uh, forgiveness, not permission bit about that, uh, about this, that as well. But undoubtedly, um, we have to um, understand the nature of risk in the education process. Because remember, it's actually the children that take the risk. It's not the teacher that takes the risk, it's the children that takes the risk. The teacher gets wrong, it's the children that have the 
and suffer the consequences. So we've got to be careful that in a search for innovation, in a search for um, uh, novelty, that we become reckless. Uh, uh, so managing risk, being clear about risk, and having the courage, once, you're, once you've thought that through, uh, in, a, in a leadership terms, the courage to pursue it, is incredibly important. But we must be very careful to think about this relationship between uh, risk and, and recklessness. Running through all of the discussions of the last uh, day and a half have been two big themes, I think, uh, which I want to finish with. Um, one is complexity. This is difficult stuff. Uh, there are, if there were easy answers, we would have arrived at them a long time ago. Uh, and it's getting increasingly difficult as the complexity of 21st century living and the way in which uh, the, for the forces which uh, uh, OECD talks about and others are acting on our schools and, and, and all of us in terms of our lives is making it more and more complex. So we need to have leadership which is not afraid of complexity. Uh, leadership which doesn't say, oh for goodness sake, um, just, just tell me what to do and I'll make sure they do it. You know, that wants to, re to reduce uh, all of this complexity down to a number of very simple uh, recipes or formulae uh, which can be used in order to bring about uh, change. And that's to do with complexity of the goals, complexity to do with expectations, complexity in terms of the resources available. Uh, and right at the start, the Commissioner talked about um, the economic environment that we're living in. We cannot make assumptions about uh, a constantly expanding education budget. We're likely to be a, 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 a budget which is, is uh, reducing. And therefore, uh, the complexity of how you consider, you continue to deliver high quality education in that environment is the challenge of leadership. It's not. It's not something you should complain about, just simply say, oh, this is terrible, it shouldn't be like this. It is like that, and the challenge for leadership is to engage with that complexity and make sure that children are well served uh, at the end of the process. And all of that, I think, uh, stresses the notion of alignment, and again, that's cropped up in a number of, of forums, that alignment between uh, the political level, uh, the administrative level, uh, the formal leadership level, and, the, and what actually happens in our classrooms. Not aligned in terms of, of uniformity, not aligned in terms of, of one model which is just applied that everyone does, but alignment in terms of shared values, in terms of, of shared understandings about where we want to get to, alignment in terms of the way in which um, uh, we, we understand the, the complexity of the, of the process and are not afraid to engage uh, in the discussions, the difficult discussions, which we have to have about um, how we engage with that complexity and how we serve our young people um, uh, very well. Um, I want to finish where I started, and that's to say, again, uh, I think this is, a, this is absolutely the right theme. Uh, uh, I think uh, coming out of this discussion and, and what's taken forward um, uh, subsequently, I hope will help to lift uh, the notion of leadership, uh, both in the agenda but also in terms of our understanding of it, uh, so that we don't end up uh, simply applying simplistic notions of leadership, uh, which if we get them wrong, could actually do more harm than good. 21st century education is complex. 21st century education is exciting. We need to, part of the solution to uh, people not wanting to be leaders uh, is creating that sense of excitement. Uh, there is nothing more important, nothing more important in the 21st century than the, than the quality of our schools. And that means that we need to get the leadership challenge right. Thank you very much.